Good morning. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the Yagara and the Turrbal people. They are the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work. I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to also um, generously and humbly extend that respect to any First Nations people who are joining us this morning. So as Michaela says, this is the third and final talk in our virtual mini series, Exploring Contemporary Art Through the Eyes of a Child. It has been a lot of fun. We've explored the art of mess and garbage and destruction, and we've encountered artists who are tired, drunk, depressed, nihilistic, and deliberately obtuse. Today, we will discover another side of the art world. So this morning's talk is organized into four sections, starting with the art of nonsense, moving on to brilliant and beautiful costumes, uh, then thinking about immersive and meditative installations and then finishing off with childhood and play. I'll be taking time after each of these sections to read over your comments and to answer any questions, so please do use the chat feature. So this week on Cry Gomez social media, we asked you if you've been taking part in any of the art world's art at home initiatives during isolation and about a third of you said yes, there have been tales of colouring in, of dressing up as artworks and of even creating little art galleries for pets at home. And we'll be exploring some of these enjoyable and mischievous and childlike ways of engaging with the art world today. So let's start with a guessing game. Which of these artworks was accompanied with a fake opening at the Museum of Modern Art? I'll give you just a moment to put in your guesses there. I don't want to tell you too much about the artwork, so I don't want to give it away, but I'll just briefly tell you about the artists. Uh, so in the top left, we have an artwork that's credited to Herbert Flugelman, but was actually done by a four person collective uh, called Optronic Kinetic which also included a figure some of you might know back in her student days, Julie Ewington, who was for a long time one of the curators at Cragoma. Uh, that collective also included two electrical engineering students. Down the bottom, we have uh, Glenn Lewis and Kate Craig. They were Canadian artists. Lewis founded the New York Corresponge Dance School of Vancouver, which is a very long and intentionally very silly name for a group of artists who swapped art through the mail. Kate Craig made the shark fin swimming caps. Uh, switching round to the bottom right, we have Harvey Stromberg. He's a much lesser known figure in the art world, but he's, what he is known for is his conceptual photography projects that blur the boundaries between reality and photography. And then above him, we have Yoko Ono, uh, a Japanese artist famous for a very long and very successful artistic career that includes daring public performances, stripped back conceptual artworks, and very quirky, enjoyable instructional works. Okay, let's end that poll and have a look at our results. And overwhelmingly, you have all guessed Yoko Ono. I do feel like this is the kind of tricky little trick that she would play but it was Harvey Stromberg who threw a fake opening at MoMA. At the time, 
The New York Times described Stromberg as a photographer or a media manipulator, a self-made chance factor, or an impresario or a guerrilla activist, a fraud, all of the above and none of the above. And in that photograph at the bottom right, we see Stromberg in the center of a crowd at his fake opening, uh, actually outside on the street, outside the Museum of Modern Art in America. If you look closely, you'll see that even the champagne glasses they are toasting are not real, but in fact a little paper cut out. So this project, this opening celebrated um, a project that had been running for two years at this point in time. For two years, Stromberg had been surreptitiously installing his project exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art. He liked to claim that he had the longest running solo exhibition at MoMA. For the project, what he was doing was taking photographs of the very banal architectural features of the building. So things like brick walls, light switches, keyholes. He would then print these photographs out perfectly to size and secretly stick them precisely over their source material. So there's a really interesting kind of play here between reality or the real world and photography or representation. And this is part of one of the longest running conversations in art history. It goes all the way back to Plato and his theory of the cave. So what I'm trying to angling at here is that this work has very serious, critical and interesting things to say about perception and camouflage and trust. But I also want to bring your attention back to that photograph in the bottom corner and have a look at Stromberg's face. That is the cheeky grin of a schoolboy prank that has gone wonderfully well. It is sneaky, but not malicious. And just like the toddler who cries out, here I am, when you try to play hide and seek, Stromberg wanted to be found. Now, just let me uh, tell you about some of the other artworks on this screen, because they all share a kind of joyful nonsense and camaraderie. Uh, back at the top left, we have the leading Australian art critic, Donald Brook, who at the time was the director of the Tin Sheds in Sydney. He was also Herbert Flugelman's boss. So this is, you know, this is an office prank. Donald Brooks says, one Monday morning, I was delighted to find my room transformed with chicken feathers, set with their quills in an obsessively regular grid, as if the room had sprouted them to its own astonishment out of its own naturally tidy follicles. I love the disjuncture in this photograph. This is a very normal office with very normal furniture and Brooke looks completely at ease going about the task of being at work. And this normalcy really heightens the kind of ridiculous incursion of the art world into this serious working space of the office. In turn, the order of the office seems to have somehow infected this prank, marshalling these curious chicken feathers into a very tidy grid. There's just one more thing that I wanna point out in this photograph. It takes us back to another era in Australia. Look at uh, his shoes. He's wearing thongs. I love it, thongs <laughs> in the office. <laughs> Okay, underneath him we have the New York Corresponge Dance School of Vancouver and here they are gathered at the Vancouver Aquatic Centre. They say that they would disguise 
their meeting as artists in the form of synchronized swimming practice. But of course, they're made incredibly conspicuous by the fact that they're wearing shark fin swimming caps. You know, there's a kind of logic that doesn't add up here. But it's a very bizarre and secret ritual that speaks to the possibilities of art. It points to the way that artists carve out spaces and places to revel in the joy of doing things that don't make any sense and don't have any purpose, but are deeply nourishing to us as human beings. Whenever I look at this photograph, I have a very kind of curious feeling of nostalgia uh, and jealousy for a place that I haven't been and a group that I couldn't be a part of, um, but that just looks so wonderfully enjoyable that I wish that I was there. And finally, we have Yoko Ono's ceiling painting or yes painting. This is a deceptively simple work. Ono painted the word yes in teeny tiny letters on the ceiling, so small that you can't read the word or see the word from the ground. But she provides us with a ladder and with a magnifying glass so that we can reach it and see it. Interestingly, a little art world coincidence, this work, just like Tracy Emmons' installation, My Bed, was created when Yoko Ono was going through the throes of a relationship breakdown. So she's kind of upset and working through those emotions. And for her, this work symbolizes both the pain and the hardship, the kind of endurance that's required to go up the ladder, but also the hope of reaching the top and finding that word, yes. I would argue that this work also relies on and then reaffirms a mutual relationship of trust and agreement between the artist and the audience. And I would say that this is really fundamental to all artworks, but that it's brought to the fore in this particular installation. So Ono promises us that the word yes is written on the ceiling, uh, but we have to then uh, take that leap of faith, climb up the ladder, use the magnifying glass to find the word written there. Reading the word yes on the ceiling then has a kind of double function of affirmation. Literally, it reads yes, but symbolically, it affirms that we made the right decision, that we were right to trust the artist. And so that relationship between us and Yoko Ono is made stronger. So from these quite quirky nonsense installations of the 70s, let's fast forward to this moment right now during isolation with one of the most enjoyable uh, art at home projects that has been made. So this gallery for gerbils was made by the curator Filippo Lorenzen and by his partner, the artist Mariana Benetti. They live in London and they were 14 days into COVID-19 induced isolation when they were feeling pretty bored and decided to spend their Sunday afternoon making a gallery for their pet gerbils, Pandora and Tiramisu. So like Stromberg's fake exhibition and fake opening, there's a very wonderful attention to detail in this little gallery for animals. Uh, so notice next to each of the artworks, there are little wall texts. We have benches for the gerbils to sit down on and <laughs> take in a long viewing time. Uh, or we have the kind of mimicry of gallery signage. We're used to seeing signs say, please don't touch. 
this sign says, please don't chew. And we see that the poor gerbils not being very good at reading, haven't paid attention to that sign. <laughs> uh, we'll see that they have recreated famous paintings from art history, uh, but also reinterpreted them to feature gerbils. So looking at that bottom photograph, we see Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring, Munch's the screen, Klimt's the kiss, and Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I want to now draw your attention to the text work in the middle of the screen by Shimabuku. Shimabuku is a Japanese artist who had dreams of being a poet and a tour guide. His practice is influenced by the chance encounters of surrealism and the disorienting politics of the international situationists. In 2003, he was commissioned by the international curator Hans Ulrich Obrest to contribute an artwork to Ulrich Obrest's Do It project. This is a project that has been running since 1993. And I just wanna take a moment here to say that Australia actually has its own version of the Do It project running right now. Hans Ulrich Obrest has collaborated with John Caldor, who some of you might know is uh, someone who brings international projects to Australia. If you look up Caldor art projects or do it, you will see that there are a set of instructions made for us right here in Australia right now. So Sh Shimabuku's uh, contribution to this project uh, is the instruction, make some artworks for animals and make them smile. This artwork extends the instructional impulse in contemporary art that we've encountered in so many of the artworks that we've talked about together. Filippo Lorenzo, and I contacted him by Twitter, that's the joy of the internet, told me that the Gerbil Gallery is not a direct response to Shimabuku's instruction. So instead, we can think of this as a really enjoyable art world coincidence. And we can certainly agree that the two owners, Lorenzen and Benetti, have succeeded in making their little animals smile. Oh, look at that bottom photograph, it's just too cute. <laughs> Okay, that's it for uh, our first quarter. So let's take a moment now for me to look at any of your comments or questions. <laughs> we have an all caps. Oh my god, this is so cute. Adorable. I love the gerbil with the pearl earring and I will never see Klimt in the same way again. Craig says, have we seen the Gecko Gallery? Uh, so yes, there's another owner who made a similar little gallery for their pet gecko, which is very cute. I don't know who Roy and Matilda are. Maybe Michaela will have to answer that question. And Jasmine says, this form of appropriation is a lovely opportunity or possibility for children. Absolutely. Get your children working on their own recreations of art history featuring your pets. Okay, let's launch poll number two. I want you to pretend that you have been invited to a fancy art world party. Who would you choose to dress you? All of these are Australian artists and all of them connected to Brisbane in one way or another. Justine Williams is a creative force. Her practice sprawls across performance, installation, opera, costume design and dance. And her very eclectic DIY aesthetic 
draws equally from the kind of crisp and beautiful lines of modern art as she does from the grungy aesthetics of the scrapyard. What we're looking at here is her twofold costume, which has appeared in a number of her performance works. Uh, I want you to take a moment to look at this and think about the references that she's making here. In terms of shape, the costume conjures Japanese geishas, entertainers who were famed for their skills in dance and song. We can see how the short bob of the costume recalls their pristine hairdos, while the wonderful concertina folds of the headpiece recall a geisha's oil paper umbrella. In terms of colour, this brilliant pink and metallic highlights sings with memories of childhood parties. It conjures paper plates and shimmering party decorations. Or we might talk about this work in terms of sound. If you look closely, you'll see that her two legs and also her arm and her hip are attached by an accordion. So we can imagine the dissonant sounds that would be caused by walking or moving, probably in much the same way that toddlers play musical instruments. Uh, we've, we've shared our poll results. I can't believe how even they are. <laughs> so about a third of you each um, voted for it, Justine, Gerwin and Hannah, but Hannah came out on top. <laughs> Good on you, Hannah. So in the middle, we have Gerwin Davies. He is a contemporary photographer and he features in all of his works. He's camouflaged and made anonymous by his costumes, which always engulf his body and conceal his head. Yet his identity is given away by his tattoos. His highly staged photography draws on the glamour and the lighting of fashion shoots, while his luxurious use of textures and pretty in pink colours pay homage to a history of queer aesthetics. And then finally on the end, yes, I love the socks too, Andrew. <laughs> I love that kind of state of half-dressed, half-undressed. Hannah Bronte is an artist and a DJ, and her artwork often takes the form of music video clips. They gather together women of colour to tell emotionally hard-hitting stories of joy and pain, of letting go, of truth-telling and of empowerment. In this particular work, Bronte has imagined a new and different Australian government of the future, which is entirely populated by women of colour who proudly speak in language. Instead of wearing suits, this new government of women is dressed in wild technicolour with stunning blue lipstick. Now we can't talk about costumes in art history, I think, without going back to this masterpiece by Hugo Ball. It is ridiculously simple and if you're interested in an art at home project, well here is my insider expert art historical knowledge on how to recreate this look at home. On his head, Ball wears a striped hat. To recreate this look, take a piece of cardboard, wrap it around your head so it fits snugly over your ears and tape or staple in place. Around his shoulders, Ball wears a cloak. To make this at home, drape a larger piece of cardboard over your shoulders and staple or tie at the front. 
Around his body, there are three further cylinders, one for his torso and one for each leg. Repeat the same process you used for your hat. You will need a friend. And finally, don a pair of gloves or make crab hands from cardboard. Note, once you are fully costumed, you will not be able to move or walk. So I suggest you have assistance on hand for carrying you. This is one of the costumes that Hugo Ball wore at the Cabaret Voltaire. This was the home of Dada and Hugo Ball was famous for wearing this costume while reciting his nonsense poetry. His most famous poem is Carawain and I'm going to read just a few sentences of it for you. Dolifanto bambla o fali bambla, krasika mfa habla horem, egija goromen. That makes no sense whatsoever. It's merely an enjoyable combination of sounds. I want you to remember that Hugo Ball belongs to the same group as Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray, who we've encountered in the two previous talks. And so his nonsense poems share the same rejection of reason, tradition and order that was at the heart of Marcel Duchamp's urinal and Man Ray's iron uh, with tacks down its center. But I also want you to take from this that there's something very whimsical and nonsensical and enjoyable here. And so if we think about Hugo Ball as a Dada S, he helps us to see these lighter, cheekier qualities in Duchamp and Man Ray too. There's a freedom and a joy in Dada that attends to the pleasure of sound and song. And in this final section on costumes, I want to turn to this absolutely joyful work by Nick Cave, a performance work called Herd that involves 30 dancers in 15 horse suits. We see them here in a photograph dancing on the lush green lawns of Brisbane River. I'm wondering how many of you got to see this performance in person in one of the very sad coincidences of the art world. I was in Sydney when this performance took place in Brisbane and then in Brisbane <laughs> it took place in Sydney. So I haven't had the chance to see this work myself, but I'm very jealous of those who have. So Nick Cave is an American artist. He's also a professor of fashion design, and he originally developed this work for the centennial celebrations of Grand Central Station in New York City. Twice a day and unannounced to train commuters, that stunning open hall of the train station would fill with the beats of percussive drums and with this parade of dancing horses. The costumes in this work are both highly sophisticated and wonderfully childlike. Have a look at their heads. There's something about them that recalls sock puppets. Uh, and if we look at all of the horses, we start to notice that the embroidery on each of them is highly sophisticated and individualized. Uh, Nick Cave has quite intentionally drawn the colors and the patterns and the processes from different cultures around the world. So there's a kind of, you know, internationalism, a celebration of diversity and difference here. Looking at this photograph, we can almost hear the swishing sounds of the raffia and imagine the exaggerated movements of the dancers in these costumes. 
I also want to draw attention to the way that the bodies are broken up into large and little blocks of colour. It's something that very much makes me think of my three-year-old niece's paintings, the way that sometimes an entire sheet of paper is covered in one colour, but other times they're swirled and mixed together in little, little bits. This work is a celebration of difference and togetherness. The dancers' movements make this point as they shimmy sometimes in coordinated movements and sometimes in free, spontaneous steps. So it champions both cooperation, collaboration, but also individuality. The artwork's title is a homonym that repeats this point, these deeply intertwined values of togetherness and individuality. We have herd as the pack of animals that stay together, but herd also as the importance of the individual being listened to. Cave describes this work about taking us to a dream state, allowing us to think differently about the world. It's a world where we imagine the importance of dance and celebration, freedom, music, happiness and colour over the concerns of capitalism and commerce that dominate our contemporary world. Okay, that's it for our section on costumes. So let's take another look at some of the questions. From Organa, we have loving the outfits. Kelly says Hugo Ball is her favorite. <laughs> Bronwyn says the reason the poll was so even is that we would probably wear all three designs. I think I agree with you on that one, Bronwyn. Craig says, it's like learning Klingon. I assume you're talking about Hugo's nonsense poem there. Donna says, how on earth did they make these costumes? Well, he is a professor of fashion design. So I'd say he has a lot of knowledge and tricks up his sleeves. And Natasha says, they're stunning colours and the sound would have been so powerful. I mean, you can almost hear the rhythm of the percussive drums when you look at this image. Okay, let's move on. So let's launch poll number three. Have you ever felt so completely relaxed and immersed in an artwork that you forgot about the outside world? I'm wondering if you can tell me about it. In this section, I want to talk about artists who prompt us to behave differently, who create artworks that surround and enfold us and ask us to move around, to kick, to sit, to lie down, to relax and meditate. What we're looking at here is works by Pipilotti Rist, a contemporary artist from Switzerland, who's famous for her mesmerizing and immersive installations. She uses quite intentionally amateurish videos and combines that with sound, light and design. Here we see two photographs from the one installation, Mercy Danube Mercy. Notice how the colours from the video projection completely fill the room. So have a look at these scenes and think about how you might describe them or what it might feel like to experience this artwork perhaps comfy or welcoming, maybe overwhelming and vivid, kaleidoscopic, psychedelic, surreal or dreamy. In the photographs, we see how audiences interact with these works, moving close up to the screen to observe the colours or sitting on those circular cushions sitting and stretching, talking and relaxing. 
Oh, wow. Um, let's share those results. So 89% of you said that you have been in an exhibition where you felt so completely relaxed or immersed that you forgot about the outside world. What a wonderful opportunity. I'll try and come back to some of those comments at the end of this section. Here we have two more stripped back installations that also ask us to move about differently in the gallery. On the left, we see the much loved American pop artist, Andy Warhol, who filled an empty gallery space with the soft and shiny sculptures of helium balloons. Uh, Andy Warhol likens these to clouds. For Australian audiences, we might think of goon bags, uh, or we might think a little bit more innocently about the kind of helium balloons we buy for parties or at the Eka and the Easter show. So this is Andy Warhol continuing Marcel Duchamp's strategy of the ready-made but here it's updated to the language of post-World War II and the new developments were, that were taking place in the kitchen. These are a kind of equivalent of snap lock bags. So they were made for housewives to keep food fresh and the Warhol saw a different possibility for them. On the right, we have Ryoji Ikeda, a Japanese artist interested in sound, light and data. His installation takes place in a completely darkened gallery. Along the floor and one wall, flashing bars of light shift, flicker and throb in tandem with a deep thumping electronic beat. This work is completely overwhelming and disorienting. It makes your own body peculiar and your shadow seem strange while its deep beast sound thumps in your chest. Both of these artworks extend the language and the ideas of minimalism. They ask us to be aware of the artwork in the gallery and of ourselves in the same space. But they also ask us to move and interact with these works in new ways. Uh, with Andy Warhol's work, we're allowed to touch and kick and throw the work. Whereas with Rio Okada's, you might stand, sit, lie down, observe. Here are two, uh, have we shared the results on that poll? Let's share the results on that poll. <laughs> Here are two very different immersive works where the past three artists asked for a kind of bodily freedom. Both James Turrell and Marina Abramovic give us very specific rules for how to enter these works. For Tyrell's work, you must put protective covers on your shoes, ensuring the installation remains pristine. For Abramovics, you must put on noise-canceling headphones. For both of these works, there's no talking. To enter the Tyrell, you use your hand to navigate the bends of a completely darkened corridor where this scene lies in front of you. When it's your turn, a guard allows you to enter the room and to stand quietly in the artwork. As the light changes colour, the contours of the room become difficult to perceive, uh, bringing into effect the Gansfeld effect. For some, this is deeply disorienting. It might produce hallucinations, Others find it incredibly relaxing and spiritually meditative. In Abramovic's work, you are not allowed to move around the exhibition by yourself. Instead, you are led from one artwork to the next by gallery volunteers who lead you by the arm. 
And if they take you to this swag, then you are given a seat at a table where you can just make out there are piles of white and black rice. You are asked to separate the rice and to count it. It's a work that some find inane and fiddly and monotonous, but others will surrender to the request to be present. They use their time with this nonsensical task to relax the body and the mind. So all of these works in this section ask us to behave differently in public space. I would say that they all require a certain level of courage and commitment and openness to being observed in these unusual public spaces. They ask for a kindness and generosity to behave differently without judgment. And while all of these take place in galleries, I would argue that these artists ask us to take these lessons into everyday life, to maybe think about ways that we can behave differently, but to do so with kindness and without judgment. Okay, let's take a moment now to read over any comments or questions from this section. Oh, so thinking about some of the exhibitions where you um, have lost yourself, Bill Viola, oh, absolutely. Um, very slow, beautiful video works. Uh, Celeste Boussier Mougenet, uh, I think she had the artwork with sparrows at Clagoma. James Turrell in Canberra as a place to relax and think about the way that your senses work. We also have Sean Gladwell, another video artist. How wonderful. I want to finish today with um, this some works about childhood and play. Let's launch poll number four. Which slide would you take, left or right? This is a huge two-story slippery dip temporarily installed in Craig Gomer's Gallery of Modern Art. And like so many of the works that we've encountered today, this work gives us permission to move through space in new ways. It asks or allows us to use the playground equipment or the slippery dip as a way of moving from the second floor back down to the ground instead of what appears now to be the rather boring ways of stairs, elevators and lifts. It is a surprisingly fast slippery dip. Participants almost whoosh right off the end. And this is calculated and intentional. It's a little wild streak built into the artwork, which Carsten Holler is referring to when he says that this work generates a unique emotional state, somewhere between delight and madness. To borrow from the Tate Gallery in London, their observation, Slippery dips were once described by the French writer Roger Calois as a kind of voluptuous panic upon an otherwise lucid mind. So Carsten Holler is a German artist. His work belongs to a new field of practice that has been dubbed Starchitecture. So this is architecturally striking projects typified by their experimental engineering, their large budgets, and their even bigger celebrity authors. Works like these recalibrate galleries from the quiet halls of introspection and challenging learning to locations of entertainment and play. So if we think back to last week and Marco Fusinato's work with the baseball bat, it's this type of work by Carsten Holler that Fusinato is violently reacting against. 
Carsten Hollis says that his works are concerned with human psychology and the kind of everyday questions that propel human choice and human interaction. And the question at the heart of this work is really very simple, left or right? Let's reveal our answers. I think we've revealed them. So uh, very, very close, but a slight win to the lefties out there. It's always a little slight win to the lefties. We all love the underdog. So it's these types of questions and answers that dominate children's choices as they play. Which book to read? Should I play on the swing or the slippery dip? Do I continue this Lego with a blue piece or a red rectangle? There's no wrong answer to these questions, just a kind of endless possibility of freedom and choice. And it's here that I want to finish this morning's talk. There's a very beautiful and long and rich history between avant-garde art and children and play. And one of the most obvious ways that we can observe this is by thinking about the striking aesthetic similarities between art and children's books and toys. Gathered here, we have the Dutch artist Piet Mondrian from Distill, Yayoi Kusama, the Japanese artist famous for her dots, Sola Witt, the conceptual artist known for his wall drawings, and a Brisbane favourite, Emily Floyd, an artist who turns educational toys into beautiful and large modernist sculptures. All of these artworks use the building blocks of childhood. These are the colours and shapes of preschool and play school that we learn through love and repetition and play. These works cry out for children as audiences. They ask to have their colours named and their shapes discovered their stripes counted or their dots whooped. And maybe these artworks can remind us to approach contemporary art with the kind of openness and curiosity and integrity of children who would never think to say, I don't get it, but instead ask why and how and can I touch it? And that is, uh, that is my ending point for this talk this morning.